Today is early May 22nd, 2023. I want to talk about the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. I want to start out as I always do looking at the map. This is liveuamap.com. It is a pro-Ukrainian live map, so keep that in mind. Uh, we, uh, a lot of the news is focused on the Donbas region. We see increased fighting around Avdivka, an area that was already in the process of being encircled by Russian forces. And of course, the biggest news of all this week is the taking of Bakhmut. And we've seen many Western media sources attempt to claim that no, Bakhmut hasn't been taken. That's just Russia saying that uh, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky misspoke when he said that it was taking no this is a pro ukrainian live map and this pro ukrainian live map shows uh, all of bakhmut under russian control and this is again all ahead of a supposedly large-scale planned ukrainian offensive a spring now spring summer offensive a lot of people are saying it's taking a very long time. Is the offensive even going to take place? We saw this last year. It was supposed to be a spring, then summer offensive. It was continuously postponed. A lot of people didn't believe that it was going to happen. They saw the, the Kharkov offensive. They thought, okay, that's it. The Kherson offensive wasn't going to happen. Uh, but eventually it did happen. So there's reason to believe that this is just being postponed. They're continuously postponing it until they feel they, they have the best possible conditions to launch it. And the conditions to launch it are continuously changed by Russia itself. But let's get into Bakhmut and uh, Russian forces taking it. This is from TASS. This is Russian state media. Putin congratulates Wagner assault teams with liberation of Aryamovsk, Kremlin. Uh, so the article says President, Russian President Vladimir Putin has congratulated assault teams of the Wagner private military company and Russian troops with the liberation of the city of Aryamovsk. And this is what Russia calls the city. Ukraine calls it Bakhmut. I've been calling it Bakhmut all of this time because both... Uh, some some on the Russian side, some uh, everyone on the Ukrainian side were, were calling it Bakhmut. So for simplicity, I've been calling it Bakhmut. I might still call it that just out of habit. But uh, just to let you know, Russia calls it Aryamovsk. So if you hear Aryamovsk, that's what they're talking about, Bakhmut. The article also says, Vladimir Putin congratulates Wagner assault teams as well as Russian troops who rendered the required assistance and shielded the flanks the completion of the operation to liberate Aryamovsk, the statement reads. Then you have articles like this from NPR. President Zelensky has said that Bakhmut is destroyed as Russia claims victory there. He gave, a, and this is uh, by the Associated Press via NPR, and he gives kind of a, an ambiguous response when asked about Bakhmut. Uh, he, the article says, Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky said Sunday that Bakhmut was only in our hearts hours after Russia's defense ministry reported that forces of the Wagner private army with the support of Russian troops had seized the city in eastern Ukraine. It also says analysts said that Russia's victory in Bakhmut was unlikely to turn the tide in the war. Who, who said that it would? The Russian capture of the last remaining grounds in Bakhmut is not technically or operationally significant, a Washington-based think tank said late Saturday evening. Can you guess which think tank they're talking about? Of course, it's the Institute for the Study of War, which said that taking control of these areas does not grant Russian forces operationally significant terrain to continue conducting offensive operations, nor to, uh, to defend against possible Ukrainian counter attacks but as usual these analysts either uh, don't understand this conflict or they deliberately ignore this fact this is a war of attrition the operation in and around bakhmut was meant to draw in ukrainian forces and equipment and destroy it and that they did and i've talked in about in recent updates uh, ukraine using some of its best equipment 
Uh, other people following this conflict very closely, the Duran, Alex Christoforo, and Alexander Mikuras have talked about some of the best units, the most elite units Ukraine has operating in and around Bakhmut. They were sent there, they were defeated, they were destroyed, and what was left of them was withdrawn. That was the whole point of that operation. That is the whole point of the special military operation. Since last year, Russian commanders have said that this is about grinding down Ukrainian forces, demilitarizing Ukraine. It is not about seizing territory. That is what Russia has been doing. That is what they continue to do. And as I go through this update and the other articles and documents that I want to go over, you're going to see how that is exactly what's happening and that the successful operation in Bakhmut was more about pulling in and destroying huge amounts of Ukrainian forces rather than actually taking the city. And it has most certainly led to the next phase or uh, has contributed toward the final trajectory of this war, which is an exhausted Ukraine and a depleted military industrial base across the West. However, Russian forces are going to need to consolidate control over Bakhmut, over the city. They're going to have to fortify these positions. Uh, and there is no guarantee that Ukraine is not going to then launch a counterattack uh, back to somehow try to take Bakhmut or to try to encircle Bakhmut. There is a pending offensive. Uh, there is a lot of suspicions that it will be launched along several axes, not just in Zaporozhye and the south toward Crimea, but also in a direction toward the east. And we know that because uh, Russia, again, going back to this New York Times article, they have created extensive defensive fortifications, both in the south and in the east. And they show you on this map. And Papasnaya in the east is directly east of Bakhmut. So there's a good possibility that Ukraine is going to launch part of this massive uh, last-ditch offensive toward Bakhmut, toward it or around it. And I highly doubt, or I could be wrong, but I highly doubt, considering what Russian forces have done up until now, that they will stand and fight in Bakhmut. I think, uh, as President Zelensky himself has said, the city is mostly destroyed. I think they will give ground, they will do a fighting retreat to these prepared defenses uh, near Papasnaya, and they will destroy the Ukrainian offensive in the process, just like they did in Kharkov and Kherson last year. But only time will tell how that actually plays out. Now, getting into the aspects of attrition that I say is the central factor that will determine the, the conclusion of this conflict the U.S. announced another, what they're calling, a security assistance package. So this is from the U.S. Department of Defense. This is dated May 21st, 2023. And if you've been following my updates over the last year, you will know that some of these packages have been massive. This is $375 million. Uh, other packages that I've gone over are, are well over a billion U.S. dollars. And the list stretches quite a bit down the page. This is quite small in comparison. Uh, and I'm gonna go over the, the items very quickly. It's mostly ammunition. There are very few weapon systems mentioned at all because there are no weapon systems to spare for Ukraine. And there's very little ammunition to spare, which is why previously, say for uh, 155 millimeter and 105 millimeter artillery rounds, they used to mention a quantity. Now they don't even mention that. Uh, additional ammunition for HIMARS, so the guided rockets, tube-launched optically tracked wire-guided missiles, tow missiles, anti-tank guided missiles, Javelin and AT-4 anti-armor systems, laser-guided rocket system munitions, demolition munitions, armored bridging systems, armored medical treatment vehicles, trucks and trailers to transport heavy equipment, no quantity mentioned at all for any of these. Logistics support equipment, thermal imagery systems, spare parts, and other field equipment. And the problem that Ukraine has had, and the problem that its Western sponsors have had, is that they are sending uh, an army's worth of equipment piecemeal to Ukraine, where Russia is able to destroy it faster than the West can send it, and faster than Ukraine can accumulate it into a sizable force to match or exceed Russian military capabilities 
on the battlefield. We have an article from Politico right here. Uh, Biden set to announce new military aid for Ukraine after meeting with Zelensky. So this is a Politico article talking about this uh, package that has now officially been announced by the Department of Defense. Uh, they're talking about that. And they're also talking about F-16s uh, down here. And so the article says, the, the news of the package comes as the U.S. president signaled that he would greenlight the third-party transfer of American F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine, telling his G-7 counterparts overnight that he will support a joint international effort to train Ukrainian pilots on the aircraft. Taking together, the moves are a strong show of support for Kiev ahead of an expected counteroffensive that Ukrainians hope will retake more territory seized by Russia. Moscow has bombarded Ukraine with missiles in recent weeks, but Kiev has had success thwarting the attacks with newly received Western air defense systems like the Patriot missile system, which is just an outright lie. We know that that is a lie. We watched the video of a U.S. Patriot, a U.S. made Patriot system in Kiev launch between 30 and 32 missiles over the course of two minutes, which is 10% of Lockheed Martin's annual Patriot missile production. That is unsustainable. Even if they hit all, they claimed six Kinjal hypersonic missiles, that is not sustainable. This is a war of attrition. If you have the best air defense system in the world, 100% effective, knocking out every single Kinjal missile that comes, but halfway through the war, you run out of missiles for your air defense system, you still lose the war. That's something very important to keep in mind. Worse still for Ukraine, however, is that they, they obviously didn't hit everything that was incoming. Something got through because even the United States had to admit something was damaged. And they talk about the Patriot missile system being damaged. The Patriot missile system, as I've explained previously, is a number of pieces of equipment. A command center, a generator, the launchers themselves, a radar system. Uh, so when you say the system was damaged, what does that mean? Does that mean that two or three pieces of equipment were completely destroyed and other pieces weren't? So you're going to count that as damaged? You don't have to withdraw it from the theater. You can actually just lump it in with the other Patriot missile battery and it can continue operating. When you think about the rhetoric that the US government used and how imprecise and ambiguous they were, it kind of suggests that's, that's something catastrophic did happen. Russia claims that they destroyed an entire radar system and five launchers. And judging by the explosions we saw in the video, following these 30 to 32 missiles the Patriot system launched, I would say that it's a fair bet that uh, at least several pieces of equipment were destroyed in that subsequent blast. Politico continues. It says countries that have flown the F-16 for decades like Belgium, Denmark, and the Netherlands have indicated that they would participate in the training program while Nor Norway is also mulling, lending a hand. All of the NATO countries are in the process of transitioning to the F-35 and have been selling their older F-16s to third countries like Romania who are desperately uh, eager to upgrade from their Soviet era aircraft. And I've talked about Romania, how over a decade, they're still trying to transition over to F-16s uh, under ideal conditions. And we're supposed to believe that Ukraine is going to be able to ad adopt and uh, utilize F-16s effectively in just a couple of months. Ridiculous. What are they actually saying, though? What they're saying, in other words, is that these F-16s are old. They're not using them all any anymore. They're dumping them anywhere where they can find them. Why not dump them in, into Ukraine? When you really think about it, these F-16s being destroyed in Ukraine are, are actually, this is actually ideal for Lockheed Martin because these nations handing the F-16s over to Ukraine will say, well, these are old. I mean, we use these for decades. Of course, they're gonna get shot out of the sky. Why do you think we're switching over to F-35s? Other nations like say Turkey or say Thailand that still operate a number of F-16s and they usually invest money in upgrading them, there will be even more pressure on them now when these F-16s are downed all over Ukraine and it's a complete disaster to upgrade to F-35s. And of course for Thailand with the US client regime taking power, it's very likely that that decision is going to be made.
I also have to point out every single time the topic of F-16s comes up that there is no special capability that it has that Ukraine's Soviet era warplanes that made up its original air force didn't have. Um, that air force is gone. Uh, these F-16s that are brought in, they will also suffer the same fate. They will be destroyed on the ground. If they're operating from Ukraine, they will be destroyed on the ground. They will be shot from the skies uh, with Russian air defense systems. They will also be destroyed by Russian air-to-air -air missiles, just like Ukraine's current air force uh, has suffered. And as Eastern European nations transfer their old Soviet era warplanes to Ukraine to continue using. They continue being shot down, uh, destroyed on the ground, shot down by air defense, shot down by air to air missiles uh, from Russia's much more capable and much larger air force. And it's actually going to be much worse for Ukraine. These F-16s, these pilots are going, if it is Ukrainian pilots operating them, they're going to be given condensed training Training to, to switch airframes can take years. Condensed training over just a couple of months, plus no experience at all on, on the airframe, minimum experience on the airframe, and then going directly into combat. That will actually put them in a worse situation than they were in when they were operating their Soviet era warplanes that they had years and years of experience on and a, a full proper training course to learn how to operate in the first place. Why is the West doing this? Why is the West sending F-16s to Ukraine if it's going to make no difference? They're going to be shot down. It's going to be another humiliation for uh, Western defense uh, companies like Lockheed Martin. Why are they doing it? It's because there is no other better option. They, The only other option is to stop, which they don't want to do. They want to continue doing this. So they're trying to find any capability that they can spare to send to Ukraine that can keep this conflict going a little bit longer. There are certain capabilities that they have that they could potentially transfer to Ukraine, but then they would be tapping into weapons and munitions that I think they want to hold on to for a potential conflict with China in the Pacific. Overall, the West is exhausting its land warfare capabilities. Uh, every couple of days or so, we see articles like this. This one was uh, pointed out to me by Mark Sloboda, who I've had on my channel several times. Washington Post, Europe's military industrial capabilities fall short of Ukraine's needs. And this was dated May 19th, 2023. So this is the Washington Post admitting a lot of the things that I and others have been saying for months now. And we've been saying these things because these are obvious things. The Western media, I think, didn't say these things because it wasn't politically expedient. One has to wonder why now it is acceptable to say these things. The article says Western governments, in particular European ones, have failed to act fast enough to turn around their industrial policy to meet Ukraine's growing needs for artillery, ammunition, armored vehicles, and other weaponry, military experts said. Kiev's existing stores of Russian-made equipment are becoming depleted, as are the West's own stockpiles, raising the risk of shortages in supplies for Ukraine by the end of the year, which will hamper Ukraine's ability to launch any further offensive, these experts said. And as I've said, this offensive that they will launch will be their last offensive. There is no more to send to Ukraine for building up another army to launch another major offensive. Uh, this was a reality that the West, Western policymakers and the Western media were going to have to face sooner or later. Uh, it is now later. The article goes on and it says, that has led to a growing realization in Western capitals that the piecemeal assistance to Ukraine so far may not be sufficient to allow Kiev to make more than localized breakthroughs along the 900 mile front line where Russia has spent months fortifying its positions. Exactly. You cannot piecemeal send equipment and ammunition to Ukraine in the middle of a war at a pace slower than Russia is taking it off the battlefield. That is unsustainable. European militaries over the years had not focused on a major war in Europe. That was not core to the planning. 
and they were not stockpiling ammunition in sufficient numbers for that type of contingency. Once again, exactly. Uh, as I have said for decades now, the U.S. has been fighting small wars around the globe. The U.S. has brought its European allies along with them. They have created an army meant specifically to fight multiple small wars all around the globe. They are not prepared. Their military industrial base is not prepared. Their militaries themselves are not organized and prepared and equipped for a large scale, intense and prolonged conflict like what we see taking place in Ukraine right now. And Russia, on the other hand, is prepared. China also is prepared. They've, they've spent all of their time and energy creating a military purely for defensive purposes and specifically for a potential conflict over their island province of Taiwan, where the U.S. is attempting to provoke a conflict. The article also talks about the, EU, the U.S. and EU working on their respective attempts to expand artillery shell production. I've talked about this many times. At the end of these efforts, they hope to be collectively producing two million rounds a year. The U.S. about a million, Europe about a million rounds per year, but that is going to take them years to do. And when they complete this process, that will only equate to about 6,000 rounds per day, and that's if every single one of these shells is sent directly to Ukraine. 6,000 shells a day is what Ukraine is already firing, and it's already several times smaller than what Russia is firing daily. And then the article talks about Russia, and it says, signs are emerging of a parallel effort in Russia to increase production despite Western sanctions. Data recently published on Russia's Federal Treasury website showed Moscow spent 2 trillion rubles on defense in January and February alone, a 282% increase over the same period in 2021, Reuters reported on Monday. Russia is on course to produce 2.5 million artillery rounds this year, this year, up from 1.7 million before the war. And then they say uh, one of the experts that they've included uh, their comments in this article. Right now, Russia is producing more artillery rounds than the U.S. and Europe collectively will be in, say, two or three, three years from now when they finally complete expanding their production. What, what does that tell you? And where do you think Russia will be in two or three years from now? How many artillery rounds do you think they'll be producing then? And that's if, if this 2.5 million this year is actually accurate. I suspect the number is much, much higher, possibly several times higher. The Washington Post concludes this article by saying, Russia has the capacity to mobilize its own economy in support of the armed forces and control its own destiny in a way that Ukraine can't. Uh, the critical weakness for Ukraine is its reliance on Western inventory and industry. And it's very clear that Western inventories were not prepared for this and their industry is not up for this. So where does that leave Ukraine? That leaves Ukraine fighting literally to the last Ukrainian because the West refuses to stop. They'll use Ukraine to uh, extend Russia as much as possible. And then they'll attempt to maneuver the next proxy of choice into place. Maybe Poland, maybe the Baltics, maybe all of them combined. Uh, maybe the West will indeed attempt to create some sort of buffer zone in Western Ukraine, just as they did in Syria. But that's where we are at this moment. The, the conflict as it's unfolding right now is a war of attrition that Russia is winning. So the, the US and their allies are going to have to do something drastically different if they want to change these dynamics in any way that favors them. And you have to remember that this is all taking place in the context of a much larger global conflict between the US and not just with Russia, but also with China. They're still attempting to encircle, contain, and wage a similar conflict against China. And we have to be very careful about this. We see Russia prevailing in Bakhmut, Aryamosk. Uh, we see the war of attrition uh, unfolding in a way favorable for Russia. But the United States is still extremely dangerous and they're still having their successes. I am based in Thailand and the U.S. has managed to install a client regime into power here in Thailand. And that is going to enhance their plans to encircle and contain 
China ahead of a very similar conflict they are openly planning against China. So this is far from over. Uh, we cannot afford to be complacent. I'm going to continue keeping an eye on all of this. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing to my channel. It's free to do and it helps my channel grow. Uh, click on the notification bell. It'll tell you when I upload a new video. I do it about three times a week. Check the video description below this video for other places you can find and follow my work. I also list all of the articles that I reference in the video in the video description below as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube channel. I will never monetize my YouTube channel. If you want to support my work, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee and also Patreon. Uh, there's other options. Again, they're listed in the video description below. And because I don't monetize my YouTube channel, if an ad for some reason pops up anyway, feel free to skip it because it's not doing me any good at all. To everyone who has been helping me, whether it's one-time donations, month-to-month -month donations, or even if you're just helping share my work with others, getting the word out there, that is all greatly appreciated. I could not do this without that support. So thank you. And as always, thank you for watching.